about every week, man. I feel like uh, a true fan of the music because I get a chance to interview people that have largely inspired me. And, uh, you know, I think it's important to note, I don't know that I've ever shared this, but, you know, when I moved to New York many years ago, um, I think it was 2001, um, everybody kept telling me, you know, it's important for you to soak up as much information from drummers so that you can figure out what kind of drummer you want to be. And, and particularly, you need to go see drummers. And so I remember getting to New York and it just, it, you know, every time I would go see one drummer, I'd be like, oh, my God, they're so amazing. And then, you know, someone would say, hey, man, I know you enjoying checking out Nash. Have you heard this person or have you heard that person? And so I think what I love about from the drummer's perspective and even what I've been hearing from different commentary from people around the world that are checking it out is that we're all learning here collectively. And I feel like, no, we can't necessarily go down the street to the Vanguard or then, you know, go down to Mesro or Smalls. But we do have a weekly episode where we get to explore these incredible drummers and artists um, and their contributions to the music. So. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, also, check out Open Studio Jazz. It's an incredible uh, re resource for musicians and, and, and those alike that just want to check out whether it's their YouTube page or their online lesson platform. I'm fortunate to have several courses. So anyway, I'm not going to waste any more time. This drummer that I have on today is someone that has always been, um, I have to say, like one of the most unique uh, and, and I was just telling him earlier, one of the most unique and original voices. Um, and even early in my career, I remember going by and spending some time with him. And he was just so incredibly kind. Um, I find that in jazz, you have like people who are, you know, you see them all over the place. Like, you know, you know, they're, they're, you know, in some ways, they're household names. And you have other people who they are household names, but they're kind of like really chill and like very like just kind of really low key. And I feel like Nasheed is very much that he is a force on the drums. He is a light on the drums. And every time I hear him play, whether it's on a record or, you know, YouTube or, or at a club, it, it changes how I see and understand the drums. I also think he's one of the most organic drummers that I've ever had a chance to experience. And he seems like his, his reason for playing drums is for the sheer love of the instrument. But it also feels that he's a person that's constantly – uh, seeking to push boundaries, you know, and that's like when I, when I, you know, every drummer, when I think about particularly in jazz, there's like a word that comes to my mind, like, and when I think about Nishit, I think about like push, he's always pushing the envelope forward. And so I'm excited to talk about him. He also comes from drum royalty, um, his father, uh, Freddie Waite. So I'm excited to welcome the one, the only one of the most original and incredible dynamic drummers on the planet, the great Nishit Waits. What's up, man? Oh, thank you, man. What's up? What's going on? Man, I'm just, I'm, I'm so excited. You know, I, I have a bunch of questions, but I, I think what I'd love to start with is obviously your, your father, but like, what is it, Nasheed, that you are reaching for every night? Because I, I feel like, like I was, you know, in, in the intro, like, you just have this like force behind you. It's like, what, you know, can you just let us a little bit in on that process of whether you're thinking about it consciously, but like, what do you... What what influences you and inspires you when you're on the kid? <clears throat> well, inspiration definitely, you know, comes from my progenitor, you know, like you said, my father and all those great, great masters that I had a, a opportunity to mm -hmm. to learn from and be in their presence. You know, him, uh, Dr. Fred King, mm -hmm. was like my godfather. Uh, Max Roach was like a godfather. Not, um, wow. not like a godfather. These were godfathers. And wow. then Michael Carver. Michael Carvin, that's the big four for me. Michael Carvin was really like my only like drum teacher in the sense that I went to lessons ah. with him. <clears throat> but um, I was able to sit at the feet of those masters and you know be in, you know break bread with them and, and, and listen to the to the stories and, and, and listen to them impart wisdom to me. Wow. So that's that that is that all those gentlemen kind of cradled me. I feel like you know and and all my endeavors, especially on the on the drum kit. Wow. Um, yeah, that's that's the that's the primary source for me. So you talked about a person that I've never heard of. Um, you said Dr. Fred King. Yeah, yeah, he was, was he, he was a he was a a member of Boom Boom as well, the percussion ah. ensemble. And uh, he was an incredible percussionist uh, who, who who hails from uh, Iowa. Wow. <laughs> and um, but moved to New York and was really. Like he's one of those brothers who was on the front lines of a lot of movements, you know, in, in terms of like teachers in New York City, yeah. with certain rights, civil rights, you know, one of those people who was tight with Paul Robeson and one of the, like one of the most brilliant minds I've ever been around in my in my life. I, I, wow. have, I was blessed to be in his presence because he's one of the wow. people when you see these books behind me yeah. in his life in his library he actually read all the books. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was not expecting that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I have, we have a lot here. We may have read maybe a tenth of the, you know what I'm saying? His books, he had like pieces of paper where he like went, went to go back. I mean, he was, he was tight like that. Incredible, incredible mind and wow. incredible musician. He played, um, percussion in the orchestra down with Pablo Casals, the um, incredible virtuoso um, uh, cellist. But he had an orchestra down in Puerto Rico and he was down there in Puerto Rico uh, playing percussion, but he also uh, started a workshop at the university and that's where he met Max. That Max did like a workshop down there with the percussion. He encouraged Max, you know, to to do like the percussion thing because Max was down there working with Abby. And my father went down there to work with Ella Fitzgerald and him and my father connected. And my father connected. So when he came back up to New York City, he was immediately um, a, a member of Um Boom. But then also he was he was like a healer, a spiritual man. I, I could talk about him for, for hours. But that I'm glad you 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 uh, brought him to, to and wanted to talk about him, particularly because in our industry, you see where uh, the focus is always is always on the famous people. You know what I'm saying? And and that's so easy. And I wouldn't say it's easily it's easy to access those people, but Dr. King had so much knowledge. It was incredible. These are the kind of, and was so active in so many areas that wow. um, uh, it's people like this that, that have really informed. Like, you know, if you take somebody like a Bayard Rustin or somebody right, right. Uh, like that who really influenced them, but you would right. rarely hear that name. For right, somebody who right. was like key into, right. into like the movement and, 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 and um, a, a lot of achievements as well, wow. you know, what, that occurred because of these people's input. He's one what, of those people. What would you say um, is like one gem that you know to pull from many that fred, dr fred king gave like if, like if there's ever because i you know because i'm at some point i'm going to talk to about you know you growing up in this house with all this energy but but is there is something that comes to mind like that he would say to you or that, that you can recall i mean he was always about being yourself about being mm-hmm. truly honest about who who you are like, you know, don't, they're not trying to be anywhere. And, and that's the lesson that I learned from all those people, really. That that really resonates. But he was okay. like, uh, um, <clears throat> in a spiritual way, you know, really being connected with uh, who you are as a, as a, as an entity in this, in this universe wow. and trying to, and trying to be um, beholden to that, as opposed to what your idea of what people want you to be or what you think might be popular or whatever, something yeah. like that, you know, or what might, you know, create a situation where you might work more it's like that that's important as well understanding those those elements but really being true to that is is to, to that to that source was wow, was wow, wow. was um was um a, a primary a lesson that i learned from him and what about max because you know it, it's funny man when i was doing my research you know for you and and just digging in deeper on your and your playing and i was literally watching videos i don't know how much of your stuff you watch on youtube but there's like these uh, clips, like there's a cat that that organized like clips of you. It's like about 17 minutes long of like like all like some of your greatest, I guess, solos that he liked, whatever. Anyway, man, I kept watching it and I'm like, Max Roach. Max, like I just kept seeing Max's approach, even like the way you move around the kit. So like, what did Max give you, man? <laughs> Like, what he, he used to tell me. He used to tell me, "Quiet fire, young man. Quiet fire." Whoa! He, he, his, that was one of his. That was one of his. Um, you know, his sayings that he was like, you know, keep you. He was like, be firing on the inside. Your stuff be firing, but nobody should see you. Like how much energy that you're actually, um, you know, um, that you the the, the the energy consumption and one and then production that you're dealing with should all be like contained because which was true because he was like energy he was like if you're doing all that you're taking away from what you could actually produce in terms of sound and dynamics and things like that and i know i have a tendency to kind of vibe and weave to a certain degree but he would be like <laughs> straight you know my father too you know he had a yeah, certain thing like that. they said they sat up you know very they sat up straight and kind of like and everything was right there michael they're very kind of like right in that one place, but everything is like, you know, you, when you listen to him, you're like, oh my goodness, you think he's like, you know, yeah. all around the kit, but they're not like that. It was about energy, energy conservation and being able to direct the energy. It was like, maybe wow. be able to control it and manipulate it into the direction that you want it to go. And I was like, so that's why I was talking, I was teaching the lesson and they were like, how come when you're hitting the drum, it doesn't really look like you're hitting the drum, but the sound that you're producing is, and I was like, oh good, I'm glad I'm, I've, I've learned, I've employed the lesson, hopefully, you know? Bro, you just blew my um, mind because I, I see that in your playing. Like I see that in your playing. That's like 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 all of this. It, like I said, fire, but it's not. It, it's not. Uh, you're not forecasting it or telling. Like, you know what I mean? It's 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 very. 
put together. So, wow. Man. So tell me what was it like growing up in your house, man? I mean, with your father, what was their active drum lessons? Was there, um, you know, hey, Nasheed, here's, you know, here's what drumsticks are. Because I know Nash, I was interviewing him, and he mentioned seeing you when you were a kid. So uh, what was that process like, you know, growing up with, with such an incredible father and, and drummer and educator? Um, you know, I took it for granted. You know, like every kid does with their, with their, with their, with their parents. You're like, oh, this is even my parents. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, these are the guys who are like, hey, I don't need me to take the garbage out and stuff like that. You know, yeah, this is this this guy, right? Yeah. But um, in all seriousness, he he was he was really incredible in the way that he he like nurtured my my I guess my attention to 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 the to the music and the drums. Like I was very, I was always attracted to it. So whatever question I had, he encouraged it. And he and he supported me. If I had a question, he would answer it. And then at one point, I think he was trying to like, kind of get me to start reading. Like he brought some Wilcox and some stick control and stuff mm. like that. I was young though, I was young. But I could, I, I could like move around with the sticks. And he was like, okay, let's start doing this. And I was like, I was very resistant. So he didn't force that on me. But I would just play though all the time. So like records and stuff like that, I can remember <laughs> like setting my drums up on the kitchen table like it was a stage and playing Are along to like <laughs> to like live at the lighthouse and whatever trying really? to play like Mickey Rogan. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, and being like frustrated because the 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 the, the, the uh, table was too narrow for me to fit the whole set and the seat on I'd be falling off the back. <laughs> you know. Wow. So I mean like as a kid you have that kind of memories. But I mean he was he was very him and my mother were very tolerant because then I would play for hours just playing, you know, just trying to work out the coordination, playing along to recordings, you know, just playing the drums for hours when I was young. I put a lot of hours in as mm -hmm. before I could read or really had anything like that. I was just mm -hmm. listening to what my father did and then trying to do different things and trying to do co different coordination things. He would show me different stuff and I'd be like, okay, let me try to get this coordination thing together just because it was challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that was my, that was my initiation in, into mm -hmm. the music. And then all the people that he was around, like he was around Oom Boom. I saw, I was at Oom Boom rehearsals from when I was, because the, the band started in 70, that's when I was born. So I was around all those rehearsals, like inside stuff when you see Joe Chambers, Warren Smith, Roy Brooks, Omar Clay, like, you know, up in there listening, incredible. I was there for that concert when they did with World Saxophone Quartet at the uh, St. John's um, Church up there in uh, the cathedral up there on hundred and. Was mm -hmm. that tenth or whatever? Yeah, 106? yeah, so. yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was there for that concert. You know, just things like that. I was there when he was like, I remember him playing a couple of gigs with like Bill Cosby. You know, just wow. weird, different things like that. You know, I, I, I was, I was, I was. You know, even some of my and, and you know they say you don't have memories when you're before you're two or whatever. But I remember I was younger than two, and I was um, the first time we went on like out of the country i went to antigua with my parents but it was on a tour with lee morgan this was like a few months before lee morgan got, got shot wow <clears throat> and that was like one of my i remember having a picture taken like on this balcony whatever you ever had some pictures like that i shared some of those pictures um with the director of that movie uh i called him morgan because mm. of out of our archive because yeah. we had a few pictures of of helen morgan you know wow. with like notes on the back so you saw how complex that story was. They they got it right when they with the with talking to uh, Benny Maupin and and all and right. Paul West and people like that because those mm -hmm. people were you you could see you know from the from the different notes and different things that she had written on the back of, the, of all, all these pictures that there was uh, she was uh, you know actually a beautiful woman in in a, in a sense you know mm. wow got caught up got caught up in a, in a everybody yeah. got caught up in that storm yeah right 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 man listening even to these stories like you know I. Uh, every time I think about you and your career, I always wonder how is jazz not old to you? You know what I mean? Like, cause I feel like, like myself and, and many other musicians, um, we fell in love with the music, but we didn't necessarily grow up around it. You know, like I grew up around like black church music and then got into jazz. But like, I mean, you were literally born into it and you've been in it all your life. Like how have you maintained the inspiration to not be exhausted by it because i'm certain you've seen so much you know yeah, yeah but i mean but there was a period that i kind of stepped away like when i was okay. when i went to high school like i didn't go to high school for music i went i oh, didn't really? play the i didn't play the drums in high school okay. or my first few years of college actually it really? wasn't until like around yeah it wasn't until i was around 20 that i kind of got back into it and and you know started kind of like learning and went back to school and stuff for, for music it, it took me a minute to kind of get back into it so i took kind of a hiatus 
Wow. And it was just, you know, and I was, then I was just going to school and doing the things that you do in high school, you know. Okay. Nice. <laughs> you know, but, but it wasn't really more, all my music stuff was, <clears throat> was really, um, at that period was kind of um, more facilitated through my buddies that kept on um, going to, uh, I went to on the music school because I grew up here in New York with Abraham Burton and Eric okay. McPherson. Oh. So they would like, you know, send me tapes and stuff that they that they liked. And um, we had a family friend, uh, Kwame Shaw, who just recently passed. He, see, Kwame Shaw is one of those names of people who, yeah, like, no. he ran a, 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 yeah, he was, he ran a, a spot in the, a, in the, like, the jazz loft scene and did gigs hmm. at Greenwich House, um, this performance space over here, right across from yeah. where Sweet Basil used to be, like, in the 80s and stuff, uh, jazz track. And then he had all kinds of people coming through that. I saw... And, and they have a li an archive of of all the people that came through that they they should make available. So he was like a producer, like his brother who was a producer, you know, from Boston. Yeah. And everybody played there, from like Kenny Barron to like Threadgill, you know, it was yeah. everybody. Um, you know, Cassandra Wilson, you know, like you know, it was just like you know, yeah. and this was the, and he was like you know, so this is like a a, a kind of not kind of but but uh, um an example of you know the self-determination that was present in the music yeah yeah you know and the legacy of that so right. so he he was one of those people uh and right. he would like you know he was a good friend of my father's and he would uh you know get make me tapes you know with, like blakey and, wow. <laughs> and stuff like that so when i was in high school i was still listening to the music you know yeah. even though i was also checking out like for the most part it was like boogie down productions yeah, and public enemy like, yeah. no nah, yeah. no nah, nah. it was like it was like all of that you know, you know, tribe called the quest and all yeah. that type of stuff, like when it was started. Yeah, so now, was, uh, mm -hmm. no, no, please go ahead. No, 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 no. no, no yeah, no. I, yeah, I was gonna say because like that's another really unique thing. Like when you were growing up, yeah, obviously you're in this jazz household, but you're also in New York City in the midst of the hip hop revolution, right? Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. So, we, like, I, I remember taping stuff at night, you know, and listening to the music consistently. I remember at one point my pops came in, came in the crib and was like, "Yo, you are definitely going." To listen to some jazz music. Are you saying? Yes, he, he was up. He was up tight. He was up tight because he was of that. He was of that. He could play everything. I mean, he was he, he like he, you know, he was on a lot of those uh, Motown hits that you that you know, wow. you know, like uh, he was on Dancing in the Streets, Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. Yeah, that's him. He was on Pride and Joy, Marvin Gaye. He was on Fingertips. What? The Stevie Wonder. Yeah, that was him. When you see when you look at the video. Uh, when they're showing how it was created on uh, one of these um, documentaries I just recently saw about uh, the Apollo, and that's when and and when they show it, it was him, young. He was young, out there on the road. He was doing the Motown review. He said he hated it. <laughs> really? The, the studio was killing because you got your money, you did your hours, and then you bounced, and you did your stuff at night. But the review was like the shows that the, the schedule them cats used to yeah. have. Wow. Woo! In the circuit, they go D.C., Miami, Miami, yeah. Chicago, yeah. L.A., in the bus. Wow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Doing wow. matinees and all four shows a day. It was wow. And the band played for all the acts. So they'd be like four or five acts, you know, Supremes, Marvin Gaye, wow. um, you know, Stevie Wonder. They'd be like four acts. And then, and they played a the whole show. Wow. Everybody did like 15 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever, and yeah. they and they were knocking, they were turning them over, man. Wow, wow, wow. This wow, is when wow. it was the po most popular thing out there. So he was like, nah, he was like, the road was 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 terrible. So, so with that said, even though he understood the relevance of popular music when it was not your time to embrace your popular music, which is hip hop, he wasn't as. I, I mean, I think because, well, he he uh, what I what I understood him to be doing later on was making sure that I understood the roots that, you know, it's all kind of comes from the same root, but understand that, um, understand what this is in the, in the cultural okay. uh, sense, right. And, and understand like what the source came from. So don't just uh, kind of get swept up in what this is because it's being accepted or it's popular right, right. now. Understand right. that you you can do that and you can enjoy it and whatnot but there's also other things that you need to be able to enjoy you know you right, don't right, right. keep 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 the keep your keep your um keep your palate and whatnot open to to being yeah. uh, receptive to other tastes you know right, what i mean right, right, right. he was like don't just get caught up in in this right here that's wow. what i that's what i kind of said so i mean he was saying jazz and also because of what you know what that meant to him also in terms of the amount of um sacrifice that mm -hmm. people had made in order 
for those people to have the opportunity to do what they were doing and get the the type of uh, money and, and whatever, yeah. even though they weren't necessarily getting no nothing no right. serious money back then, but the potential was there. And he was like, yeah. understand all the um, the elements that are involved in creating yeah. this awake situation, yeah. you know. But also, also be aware of where you come from and and the the type of sacrifice and the type of um, yeah, the type of sacrifice that was made by, mm -hmm. by all these individuals that, that came prior to, including himself. Yeah. He was like, don't forget about your old man. I did a lot to, to cultivate your mind so you can think, Whoa. you know what I'm saying? I, I, I made a lot of choices and wanted to, and put you in situations and whatnot and, and created situations so that you could you know, have an opportunity yourself to keep your mind open. You know, I, I, my, all my wow. parents, my uncles, you know, all my all people were very... As as I'm sure you were, because as, as I'm sure your people were, because of the way that you yeah. that you handle yourself, um, and most of the brothers and sisters out here that I, that I see in the uh, mm -hmm. in the community, to, to be quite honest, but you know they were encouraging you to to think. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Think. Don't get caught up. Don't get too caught up in what's happening right now. Think. Keep keep your keep your head open. Wow, keep your head wow, open. Wow, wow. Yeah, and it's so interesting. Like I, I you know, I always knew like you came from like a very rooted place but i think what's kind of unique to me listening to you speak is is the huge like afrocentric background you got but it makes sense because you grew up in new york city like <laughs> you know what i mean and that like new york city is really the epicenter or, or kind of the root of like a lot of what we end up getting later in the south it all started with you guys in terms of like the new type of thinking and even like people that migrated from here up there you know so um i didn't like it makes sense now when i i think about your playing because it has this really beautiful energy you know, in it. So, so that, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. yeah, yeah. That my I mean, my father was originally from Jackson, Mississippi. He grew up in Jackson, wow, Mississippi, wow. and then and then went up to Detroit, and then wow. came to New York. But he likes wow. he's straight country. When you hear him talking, like when you were talking about, uh, when I'm talking about, like, uh, <laughs> like uh, when he would be home mm. and he'd be talking to me, he was talking to me like he was talking to his like to his mother down in Jackson. So I would be like, what? You know, like, oh, go on and get the thing. You know, voice change and everything. Really? Playing, like straight country, like wow. straight country. And then I'd hear him like an election demonstration talking about like and the onomatopoeic uh, expression. I'd be like, is this the same person <laughs> that was just like <laughs> telling me to go get the thing over there on top of the thing? Uh, go over there and get the thing on over there on top of the thing. And I'd be like, what? What do you, you know? And wow. then be like, like straight country, yeah. straight country. But then yeah. like, you know, so I mean that was that's that's the beauty of uh, of our of our um, of our story, you know. We gotta we gotta be you know all it's, things. It's, that, it's complex. <laughs> it's complex. It's complex. No, you know the, what I'm saying? It's man, very complex. Man, Nishid, I wanted to shift to like more drum stuff and and ask you about like okay, you grew up in the house, you know, because we're gonna get into you know your career stuff and all that. But so you grew up in the house with Freddie Waits. You have cats like Max Roach coming through, and as you said, you're meeting Roy Brooks and all these great musicians, Michael Carvin. What is your uh, understanding of the actual drums? Like, you know, does your does your dad say, "Okay, you're gonna play this Gretsch kit"? Is that kit that was on the you know kitchen table? Was it Ludwig drums? You know, were you introduced to you know Remo drum heads? Because also, I mean, cat like him, he's probably got access to some of the most killing stuff. And and I remember when you invited me over, you you I, I got to see some of you know his drums and stuff. But I, for our audience, you know, what is that process like? Kind of the drum nerd. You know, part of part of right. this conversation. Yeah. Right, right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still not that person, but uh, probably <laughs> because, know. probably because, not nah, probably because it was around me. Like, like yeah. I said, I kind of took it, I took it for granted because my father had uh, endorsements with Zildjian and, and Greg, oh, wow. and so he had sets. You know, and I was like, oh, you know, I just it was. He was like, I never even had a uh, pursued a drum endorsement because I had uh, all of his sets. Yeah. You know, I was like, I was like, I'm good for the rest of my life. Really, I'm, you know, I don't really, I don't have to. I had cymbals and um and some sticks, but uh, just recently I started uh, endorsing Ludwig. But it, he was always. Oh, a really? You were Ludwig he, now? Yeah, I'm with Ludwig. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. and are you are you there too as well? No, no, I'm I'm with Tama, but I know like Nate and Kareem. There's like, yeah. like I feel like Ludwig yeah. is really making that push to to support the jazz drummers. And I, I, I love that. Cause I know you're like, so not a commercial cat. So that's, right, that's shocking right. that they got right, you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know I'm, I, I flew under the radar. I flew under, yeah. I flew under the radar. I flew under the radar. <laughs> to, to but my father was a stone cold Gretsch um, wow. uh, guy. And mm. so once I, my grandmother actually gave me my first set of drums, she mm. sent them to me and she gave him his first set of drums too. What? She gave me my first, yeah. She gave me my first set of drums. She sent it to me. 
And um, and once I, but they were, uh, it was a kit before they were like, uh, this was like the kitty kit that okay. didn't even have the lugs that you could remove. So once you oh, broke wow. the head, like it was broken, right? Yeah, yeah. And I taped the head together so many times. So once I beat that set to like, to smithereens, <laughs> my father was like, okay, you've earned. And was like, he was like, in order to get the set, to get another set, I was like, I want to get your set and want the other set. And he was like, well, you know, in order to do that, you have to really, you have to practice. Like he was like, you have to be putting some time in. So even th- and I got the first set when I was five. <laughs> so he was like, he was like, he was like, now he didn't necessarily tell me what to play. He was like, but you have to play. He was like, you have to spend some time on the instrument. Like, I'm not just going to give it to you because you said you want it. I have to see that you actually want it. So I would be hit. So my job was to like beat the drums until they were just like shredded. Until <laughs> I like taped them. I had over taped. They were just taped. It was just taped yeah, on the yeah. drums. There was no more drum head. They were just like, <laughs> right? And he was like, all right. And then he gave me a set that he had that I think was like, this was from like the late 60s, a set that he had at Gretsch that he didn't use anymore. And I think, I don't, I don't know if this set was the one that he played on like those McCoy Tyner albums and stuff wow, like that, yeah. but I fantasized that it was because it would have made sense. It was in that time period, right. you know, right around early 70s. So, you know, some Another Earth or some of those other recordings. I mean, I think it was used on some stuff. So, so and it was a round badge one. You know, with the you know eighteen, twelve, and, and the fourteen, it was it what was a like first kit. yeah, it was incredible. <laughs> it was inc- yeah, right. I didn't realize it doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any better than You're that. Like right? Starting with Rolls Royce, <laughs> right, right, right. I didn't realize that the Madra exactly, exactly. <laughs> so um, and then symbols wise, I just played his symbols, and they were Zildjian's, and he had like he had one that was cracked, that Max gave him, and he never he liked A's more than yeah K's, i remember yeah he had actually. a brighter sound yeah yeah he liked like when you listen to like those uh expansions and that time for china it's like yeah. an a it's like an a thing and i was like oh yeah. wow he had a um that was what he liked he liked that definition and i kind of like mm. that cut um but he had a couple of k's in there later on he played like a 20 inch k and i played that for a while until i started playing a 22 i, I primarily played like a 22 on yeah on the way. And you play darker, you know, because that's another thing too. I noticed about your setup, like you play more like 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 a darker, um, not necessarily dry, but like it's very creative kind of symbols. Can you talk about like you know coming from your you know your father or hearing that sound, this sort of brighter sound? Uh, how did you evolve into like hearing like what what your setup is now? You know? Well, I, <clears throat> like it seems like when we were coming up, like the. Like drummer was generally like louder, like just the whole music was louder, right? And then it seemed like maybe around like that time period, like it was getting softer in terms of just the volume, right? Mm. For me, right, as a listener. And then just the places we were playing, <laughs> we were playing like a lot of my early gigs, like at restaurants, you know, just I'm like saying, you know, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying. So yeah. it wasn't really like about being heard; it was about like being seen. They were like, "We don't really want to hear you, really." <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't hit a nice lady who's singing in front of you, but you, we just want to kind of like, if you could just kind of like just keep it low. But but even on the serious tip, I mean, that was a component of it. But then even with, you know, other gigs, um, I remember going to hear Jack DeJanet with Keith Jarrett. And he was like, uh, Jack DeJanet was another like uncle, you know, him and my father were tight. Him and my father were really close friends, you know. Uh, after my father passed away, you know, he would come through. He was very, very kind. I'm like, yo, you know, if you need anything or whatever. Wow. And, uh, you know, whenever he was playing, he'd be like, yo, come through to the concert. So I remember going to hearing him and he was like very light. And, ten- and I was noticing his cymbals were like dark, dark. And I was like, I like that. I like that sound because you can, he was like, well, the key is so that the piano can be heard in this particular situation. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure that everything is audible. So you don't want any, and, and then there's a lot of, the dynamic level is, is not that wide. So you want to be able to create a wider dy- dynamic level. And you can do that here easier with these symbols because, wow. you know, symbols have a tendency, you know, they resonate, which is what yeah, you want generally. That's part of it. But you have to have something that kind of has a, a presence but doesn't over uh, overtake, you know, sonically um, all the other overtones and things that are happening with the other instruments. Just So it was, I was like, okay, let me keep that in mind because, you know, playing with people like Fred Hirsch and mm-hmm. even Andrew Hill and whatever in trio settings, it was important to be able to still maintain the intensity, but but not necessarily um, have the have as much volume. Man, so so I first of all, thank you for that. But I got to go back to 
you played the, like I know, you know, I came up playing them singer gigs, playing at, you know, Sophia's and you know whatever. But you yeah. did that too in the sheet? I think everybody did, man. I think that's when I first met Jason Moran. We was playing with what? a singer. Yeah, we were playing with a singer in the flower shop and she was talking about uh <laughs> Uh, give me a pig's foot and a bottle of beer. That was the day. That's the first gigs we hooked up on. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I, I guess, oh, like, yeah. when I look at guys like you and, you know, like, again, especially you you guys are, like, a generation ahead of me. I just feel like y'all, you know, in my dream, uh, you know, imaginative mind, I feel like y'all just, like, rolled out of the womb, like, playing the Vanguard. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, not me. Cause so not me. Just because y'all were so original. Like, I know there's, like, because, you know, the way I came on the scene was, like, subbing for a bunch of people and, like, sort of just playing whatever gigs I could get. So, I guess for you, I, I never would have thought that was your Oh, journey. yeah, man. Oh, yeah. And I learned a lot in those wow. situations. I, I wouldn't, I really learned, like, brush, brush work, especially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know how to get a sound out of the brushes, how to you know yeah. be able to make to be able to play all those rhythms and whatnot with yeah. a bass drum and stuff like that. How do you play a samba with a bass drum? Get get down. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because you know that's classic. You got to play you know a soft that's, samba and all that's that. What I'm yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know you got a snare drum and you did like make it happen. Right, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so because I, in those situations I would challenge not only challenge myself but it also became like I was like okay. It's, it's, it's really not even about the drums. Yeah, at first, you you get there, you want a solo and stuff like that. Yeah. And okay, this is not what this gig is about. Let me like get the most out of it. And that would be like right. repertoire. So I'm like finding myself listening to lyrics, checking out all these incredible like songs with like these different forms, cheek to cheek, and all that kind of stuff. You know, these like interesting. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is actually. You get to a point where where, where I kind of had my fill of it, but it was it was years of like in the trenches. Not even you know, it was it was an education. I feel like yeah. it was a part of the education because. It, it like it lets you know how to navigate and, and dynamically, especially, it lets you know and let you understand like how to be able to again the quiet fire, how to be able to mm. to retain the intensity, but at a at a low level, you know, low energy, low yeah. dynamic level, still be able to communicate um, different emotions, not not being like you know um, reduced because it has to be wow. uh, pianissimo. Wow. So so you know, with that said, as we transition into career stuff, which you've clearly had an, a, a, a really great and unique career, you talk about, you know, Quiet Fire, you talk about like how to harness, you know, all this energy, but also like, you know, knowing what to play on the gig. I know you teach a lot. What would you say are maybe three or four things that you, sort of advice you want to give to kind of the next generation? Because part of the, the audience that that listens to this or watches that watches this, these shows, they're uh, fans of the music, but then a lot of them are students who will probably never, or or should say I should say it'd be a long shot if they get a chance to even meet you. You know what I mean? So before we deal with like kind of your your specific journey with some of these great collaborators, what are three to four things that you want to give to the next generation of you know whether it's hey learn a samba beat or learn how to play brushes? Like what what is that you know uh, for for today's jazz drummer? You know? I mean, a, a lot of those lessons, or, or I, I guess th things that I would I would like to uh, share or emphasize, are the same ones that were emphasized to me. And, okay. and uh, probably number one is what we've been talking about the whole time is like really be yourself, uh, tell your truth. That's that's going to mm -hmm. lead you. So that may lead you to exactly to making that decision: is this music for me, or is it not? Or I'm just, it was it just me for me to enjoy? Can I be? A, how do I contribute to it? Do I want to mm -hmm. contribute to it as a as somebody who um, is a practitioner who who performs, or is or is or am I do I want to contribute to it in a fundraising sense? Do I want to raise money for it? Mm -hmm. Do I want to just be a patron? Or do I or do I just want to be somebody who likes the music and wants to support it and and mm -hmm. wants to expose other people? I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can contribute to the um, to the culture. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one. Okay. So, it, it, but even within that, but even in the musical way, especially like, you know, telling your truth, you know, and then and like maybe like a, a one slash two situation, one A slash two thing in that would be, and in doing that, it's also important to uh, acknowledge the, the source from which, you know, this mm -hmm. culture was um, born. That's powerful. So, so like, you know, you I think to really get inside the music you have to humble yourself to regardless where your uh, origin is <clears throat> to humble yourself to um to acknowledge the uh, the black genius and black greatness that was created in spite of the conditions from which it was created mm. you know what i'm saying so i mean the unfortunate history of slavery and all mm -hmm. that that's the that that spawned 
um, and, and it mutated what, what we call quote unquote jazz music. Mm. So, I mean, we have to acknowledge that as a society and, and, and embrace that understanding, right. you know, with, with all its horror and, 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 but still be able to be like, yes, these brothers, this is right here, contributed right. something um, incredible to the, to the uh, universe. And it's, and it's had a contribution from everybody. And now it's not just, it hasn't just stayed that, you know, now mm -hmm. it's completely international. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? There's been contributions from everybody. And then it, it was too. I mean, there's, there's always been contributions mm -hmm. from, from, from all, all different aspects of society. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's not saying that, but we're talking about the source of it needs to be acknowledged. And, and, to, and to a large degree, the people who, who um, made, you know, those shifts in the, in the music. You know, like, you know, taking all the way back to Louis Armstrong and before that and whatnot and, and all the way through the pantheon of great individuals that um, contributed. I mean, now there's a long list of people. It's not saying like you can you, you can go forever. That's how that's one uh, to answer one of your earlier questions. Um, things when you're um, when you're talking about how do you not get bored? I mean, there's so many people I'm so right. fascinated with. I mean, I also that's what I was majoring in when I was in college was history. So I like uh, it. Okay. I'm like fascinated with like who did this and who created this and who affected this person, had this person come to this, you know, that's fascinating for me. So I'll never get tired of, of that, you know, aspect of, of the music, the historical mm -hmm. aspect, who made these contributions. Mm -hmm. There've been so many contributions made, but it's it will be there's certain things that you should, you know, key elements of this music that if you just want to be a good musician, you should be aware of. If you're interested in being a musician, that you can be aware of that will inform you to be whatever you could be a hip hop producer, but if you right. know about these, if you know about these entities, if right. you know about the function of you know and, and what and what a uh, <clears throat> what a second line band sounds like, or if you know right. what the Henderson sound like, or you know that's gonna help a Pharrell Williams. You know what I'm saying? Like undoubtedly, you know what I'm saying? That's gonna aid those people. That's gonna aid on any of these incredible producers. I mean that that type of understanding. Duke Absolutely. Ellington. Absolutely. Have you have you listened to those bands? The right. Prince was always talking about Duke Ellington. They're like, Yo, Duke. <laughs> wow. You know what I'm saying? So it's like check all that stuff out and incorporate that into your understanding of the music. Wow. Wow. Man, that's, yeah, that's powerful. So, so with that said, um, you have a vast career, man, of people you collaborated with, you know, um, I think for me, probably one of the most notable relationships that you've had for many years is who you mentioned earlier with Jason Moran. Um, can you let us in on, the evolution of that relationship, you know, for instance, bandwagon, um, you know, that you you guys have maintained for many years. Um, I know now you're working with Christian. Um, you guys have the new John, which uh, is an incredible band. I, I was, you know, listening to checking some of that stuff out. Um, and then so many other people that, that you mentioned. So can you maybe just, you know, walk us through the, the Jason connection, but then also uh, let us know some of the other people you've been collaborating with through the years. Cause I also noticed with you, like, Whoever you work with, you work with them for a long time. <laughs> you know, like, I feel like, you know, you have other cats who they kind of, you know, do the round robin. But I feel like you build these, like, really substantive, elastic relationships over time, you know? Um, yeah, I feel like we all kind of have that. We all do we all do a little bit of that. But, like, you find yourself here because you were yeah. somewhere else for a little bit too long and then yeah. you circulate. <laughs> um, you know, we all work in, them, you know, those, those circles that yeah. are concentric and they're intertwining as well. Um yeah, man. I mean, uh, Jay, Jay. I mean, I've been so so blessed to to be um, in the bandwagon with Jason and Taurus. Um, they're like my brothers for real. Mm -hmm. They're some some of the most. Um, they have some of the most in integrity. Those brothers have high level of integrity, and uh, I love them for it. I'm a better person and better musician for my uh, association with them. Um, and it kind of started. Jason was roommates with Stefan Harris and he was working with Stefan and or he was I think me and Taurus he he Stefan started using me and Taurus and we had a couple of gigs and then Jason was his roommate and then we started they had a couple of gigs and uh then Blue Note came uh, with a um an idea to tour some of the younger musicians that were on the uh, label so that at that time it was Jason uh, Moran and Stefan Harris and Mark Shim and um, and uh, who was the other person? Mark Shim, Stefan Harris, uh, Greg Osby, oh, yeah. Taurus Mateen, and, and myself. 
So Greg was like the uh, was the elder statesman. He was the mentor of the band. Wow. <laughs> um, and uh, it was great. It was great. We had a we had a blast. We did like about a three months a tour in the, in the states, and then we did a recording after that. But and during the course of that of those gigs, uh, we as a trio, Jason Torres and myself, we started developing a. a <laughs> a level of comfort <laughs> with each other. And we were like, we were exploring every night. It was a blast. Um, and out of that, Jason was like, okay, I think I'm gonna, I think he went that direction. And he was using, him and Harlan were really yeah. tight. Uh, yeah. And Harlan was playing with Terrence oh, Blanchard okay. at that time. And so uh, he was like, so Nasheed, come on, let's, I was like, yeah, let's let's jump up in there. And we did the first recording. And then from that, it just it just went on. And we've, we've, we've been together for over 20 years now. And that's a, uh, yeah, special, special, special situation, special can, situation. Can, can you go a little bit more micro into what do you, you know, you mentioned this earlier when you were talking about Jack, about like symbols and playing with pianists. But I find that you and Jason have this thing where it's like y'all move together, you know. Can you talk about what is it that you're employing when you play with, like to support Jason Moran, who, you know, I've had a chance to work with a bunch of pianists who were like they he was their teacher. And one of the things they talk about with Jason is how he's always like he's like, all right, you learned that. OK, now play it backwards. Like he's always making people do things that are really against the grain. So, like, how do you as a drummer accompany that every night? Like, what are you like? Like, just a little bit more micro into that. Like, like what is that process? You know, it's very liberating actually working with him because it wasn't really like I felt like it was support in that way. I felt like okay. it was more like, and me, and, and just in a one way, like it wasn't just me supporting him. It was it was like more of a collective type of thing, because his his, you know, a lot of times we used to, we went through phases where we would just play like as hard as we could, like in the frenetic kind of like almost hmm. like to uh, like a swarm of locusts or something like, yo, can we get the <laughs> locust swarm for as long as we can? Wow. <laughs> you know what wow, I'm saying? Yeah. Where, where you come out of it like, oh, oh, but, you, <laughs> oh, but you be, you're, on the, you're on the gig though, you know what I'm saying? No, you still got like wow. another 50 minutes to go, like go in there hard, you know? So we had different, levels. <laughs> we had different stuff <laughs> wow. that we would do to, to, to challenge each other or to try to create these different ecosystems and env sonic environments. Mm. So a lot of times it wasn't necessarily about like, <laughs> like Jason said that, uh, I think they were talking, somebody was telling him, yeah, they wanted him to do a trio recording. And then once it came out, they were like, yeah, not like this. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the kind of trio recording we were talking about. Wow. We went to something where there was, it was like you playing and them cats supporting you. He was like, now nah, this is like, you know, cause that was the way he wanted it. He would. He didn't want it like, okay, I want you to play this like this, and I'm gonna solo here on top of it himself, and then you shift. It wasn't like that. It was like I want there to be a, a very serious spirit of the uh, of the extemporaneous hmm. and, and involved in whatever we do. And then, and we grew a lot too, you know, because of course there are times to do that where you naturally do that, you know, where you naturally, oh no, this is my time to to lay it down right here. Right. And this is his time to because a lot of times when he plays the bass function and Taurus is, is doing something else, you know? So everybody is like very you have the freedom, but within that freedom there's a lot of discipline as well. The discipline wow. exists in, in there as well. And you and the older I think we got or I got, I became even more aware of, you know, how do you whatever you're doing, how do you still create a certain uh, level of comfort? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Even as wild and as off the off the beaten path as it may be, and how do you communicate that, or yeah. not? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting you say that because I feel like even in my own situations where I feel like a band starts with everybody playing the role that they're supposed to play stereotypically, and the bands that I've had a chance to really develop something special is when we kind of abandon that and we actually play together. So it's really yeah. it's really cool to hear that from you and Jason that like that's because that to me it comes across on the records you know? oh yeah 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 it's, I, I can't talk about that situation without it being the three of us collectively involved in it because everybody is so is so vested in what's happening but then every at any particular point somebody can can quote unquote take the lead and dictate yeah. we're going to go this direction or I'm going this yeah. direction and, and that kind of be the prominent yeah. the prominent voice at that particular point. And that's like, he he's so like egoless with that. Mm. 
you know, and open with that, Jason. It's like, we, there was never a thing like where it was like, oh no, we got to get this right. There was always like, okay, well, let's just embrace what that is mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and keep it moving and see what happens with that. Very, a very like, really, really understanding and empathetic and also highly creative because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, at any particular time, anything can happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There, there are no mistakes. Wow. wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's the mentality with with with, uh, with Jason and Taurus. Who do you feel other than with those guys that um, best represents? I mean, everything you do is killing. But but if you were to say from your own perspective, like there's other collaborators that you feel brings out a uniqueness of your sound. Like who who would that be? I, I think I think it's I think it's everybody. I, I okay. feel like everybody. I mean, I come from uh, I, I had the opportunity to around the same time when I started uh, working with Jason. I also started working with Andrew Hill, who's right. like you know the one of the fathers of, of right. Jason. So I had a, a long stretch with Andrew Hill, and he's one of those other mentors, you know, along with Max and mm -hmm. my father and Michael Carvin, who was who was a teacher and like a really close friend as well. And he was, it was the same way with him, you know, mm -hmm. uh, his music, <clears throat> although you may think of it kind of like more um, and, and free or to lack of better words, um, but there was the structure in his tune and his situation was, <laughs> it was, it was, com it was complex, mm -hmm. you know, and like, it was like having a conversation with him <laughs> it was complex, you know, wow. because of the way he communicated. Mm -hmm. you know, with parable and then he would talk and, you know, you'd be like, really? wait a minute. Yeah. It'd be like half sentences and then he jumped to some to another thing, you know, and he had like a little stutter. So it was like, you know, the first time I talked to him and he asked me to work with him, I was so elated, but I only really mm -hmm. understood maybe about 20% of the conversation. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> I was wow. like, uh huh. Yes. You know, and it was, you know, it was, I was like, and then as I got to spend time with him, I, I could understand him. A lot better. It caused it caused you to to really key in and listen. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Even having a conversation, and it was always the exact opposite of what the obvious was. There'd be times where he play a melody, and I'm listening to it, and he'd be like, "Okay, you know," I'd be like, "Okay, great." I get out my sticks, and he'd be like, "I get out my brushes," and he'd be like, "Oh no, 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 no! I want triple time underneath this," and I'd be like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> You know, so it was like a, yeah, the thing that I was anticipating and expecting. He was like, no, no, no. I want you to think like this. There were times where I was playing with his big band. And he would, uh, he would take my music from me because I was being too deliberate with the way I was, like, setting up certain six sections and stuff like that. He was like, yeah, I don't really want that <laughs> at all. He was like, yeah, wow. the way the way the traditional big band functions and, or the traditional big band drummer functions <clears throat> in terms of you like having that type of relationship with the lead trumpet player and all that type of thing. He didn't want any of that. But you're wow. setting up certain sections like the way, you know, like playing the prepositional command. Okay, pop through. You got he was like, no, no. <laughs> he, was like, he was like, I don't want any of that. He was like, I don't want any of that. You know, even so with the what did you do? Yeah, I, I played. I played from what I remembered, and I tried to, to not anticipate those sections and to let them see what they would be like without that type of uh, sound, you know, associated with it. And it made it sound different. It made it. It made it. It made the uh, big band feel more like, like a large amoeba, as opposed to like you know that type of like fractured yeah, type of, course, of like of those 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 type of yeah. sharp cuts and whatnot. There wasn't a lot of sharp edges. It evened out those sharp edges, sonically speaking. And I was like, oh wow, this is incredible. You know? And he would also do things like well we would rarely start the song at the top of the, the piece. We really? <laughs> so, yeah the whole band he'd be like, yeah we're gonna start on bar 69. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, man. He'd be bringing an insert the day at a gig, like, uh, we're gonna just start here and then go to seventy three, <laughs> and then be like, you know, we were like, what? So it was like, yeah, it was like that. He was he his his quote was famously to me was, um, yeah, Nasheed, that's great that you can read the chart and everything, but fuck the band. I want to have some fun too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing this down. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. 
he was like, man, play, you know, we played, because we had played quite a bit of trio and like sextet stuff by that point. And he was like, yeah, that's great that you can, you know, read the chart and everything, but that's not, and I, and I knew what he was talking about. Like, you know, you have to remove your ego. And he was like, don't, but don't do what you thought you should do. You're like, nah, Dude, like this is more in this area. It's man, this is so deep because um last week I, I interviewed Billy Drummond. And you know, Billy spent time with Oh, I, I I I I came right after Billy. Oh I think Billy went to play with Sonny Rollins or something like yeah. that. And and so he he was he was conflicted and Andrew was like, and I was like, Woo! Yeah, but Billy was on that amazing dusk record. Woo, yeah, yeah, Billy. Well, and so it's interesting, like, because I feel like you and Billy, though you're obviously very different, but you all have the same like it's so interesting so for those that are watching like please go back and if you didn't check out billy's interview check out billy's interview after this because it's the same like i could tell you i work with the same cat because just like the way like billy approaches music the way that like it's almost it's like water and it's just it's it's this flow or whatever like i could tell that you both were heavily influenced by by him. oh yeah man oh yeah yeah anytime you got anybody who had the opportunity to spend some time with mr hill was definitely blessed Wow. With the uh, and he would be talking about you know, collect you know, he'd be talking about Dixieland bands and Ben Webster and stuff, really? like yeah, he'd be referencing those kind of people, but wow. playing like all the stuff that you would be like, and then you but then you heard it, you'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, he's you know, but it was the way that he did it, you know, the way that he voiced his stuff and the way you know, he just really opened up, you know, used the whole yeah. piano, like you yeah. know, he used the whole instrument, it kind of you know, beautiful, really, really. I mean, I, I'm so grateful to, to him that I was able to spend that time with him. Man, no, I, I, I love, I love these stories, man. I, you know, I have a few more questions and then, uh, you know, uh, you know, let you go, man. Cause I, I appreciate your time. Um, I want to ask you about, you know, before the call, we were kind of talking about, or I should say before we went live, we were talking a little bit about the music business. And I remember visiting you, uh, years ago at your, your studio and, and you have a whole other kind of music business entrepreneurial side of things where you're not just a drummer like you you have some things like you're being very strategic about can can you talk a little bit about that side of things and also maybe about like what is your vantage point of of, of what we're dealing with now because i know we were you know earlier to let the audience in we were talking a little bit about marketing and and you know uh particularly sometimes as drummers our recordings don't get heard as much um because sometimes we get pushed to the back of the marketing van and you know the more of the usual suspects get pushed to the front um so yeah any any of that you want to share because i mean clearly you have this like incredible history of of being around some of the movers and shakers of this business so how has that informed how you choose to show up you know well well i think you have to diversify or, or at least for me it, it, it's it's always been natural to to do that you know my father taught me that by example like i said he played with everybody or worked with everybody from you know you know the, the motel situation to martha Reed, i mean to um to ella fitzgerald to mm -hmm. To uh, you know, Lee Morgan to Cecil Taylor to Umbu, you know what I mean. So I mean, it was a wide range uh, of that that he dealt with. It was all, it was all music. Um, so you know, b being open to to um, expressing yourself in a lot of different ways is is important. But also, um, you know, taking ownership of not only your voice but of your, I, I guess, your image or, or whatever you would would want to call it. You know how how you were perceived. Um, out there in the world. And in this juncture, I guess you have an opportunity to do that because now it's like all your publicity kind of comes through the social media. It's like, it's almost like the publicist right. is not obsolete, but they are, that that job is also uh, part and parcel to what you do and letting people know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, and even I'm like, I'm like not the person who's, who's very active in it, but I see that you mm -hmm. do, that is a component of letting people know um, what you have, and and at this point, there's a lot. There, you'd be surprised how many uh, people are, are interested in your whatever it is you have to right, offer. Right, you know what right, I'm saying? Right. Uh, whether it's music or whether it's some of your knowledge or, or input on certain things, yeah. you know, in terms of your connection to the instrument, in terms right. of things of that nature, there are a lot of people who are who are interested worldwide. And now it's 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 a lot easier for us as individuals and those individuals to contact us directly. Right. And uh, and you and yet you, you just have to be motivated to be able to take advantage of that or get somebody to do it for you. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Right. But right. but you have to you have to do it. I mean you you're an excellent example of, of how to capitalize on that. I mean, you know, and it's uh 
it's just it's what it is mm -hmm. and and i think it gives you uh, the, some power as well because that's yeah. that's that's you creating these these scenarios for yourself yeah. you have complete ownership of it so that that's yeah. that's something that i think is very empowering because um we know that the legacy of music or anything else in, in this country or any country is all about the artist not owning <laughs> their material and not owning their content and right. not being able to dictate the narrative and so forth. So now right. I, I feel like there's a lot more opportunity for, for that to happen. Right. right. Um, in, a, in a situation where you can, where you control those, 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 those aspects of your product. Yeah. And, and it's so funny you say that I, I've been telling artists that so much recently, um, via many, many different ways, uh, but that we have the power now. And I feel like, you know, I, you know, I, I feel like when I got to New York, it was the end of like the young lion jazz era. It was the end of, you know, you know, you graduate music school, here's a recording contract. When I got <laughs> right. there, it was figure this thing out and more, you know, and I, I came into like everybody recording their own albums, you know, versus I feel like you were part of an era where everybody's first record for the most part was on somebody else's bill. Whereas in my generation, all of us have, if, you know, we've either paid for every, like all of our records or most of our records, you know? Right. So just that shift alone. But to your point, we now have the control to be able to promote because like when I first came out with my, you know, initial record, I had to pay a publicist and whether they worked it or not was, you know, up to them. Now, to your point, um, you have more control. So I know some people are over social media, but that is the reason why I embrace it. Cause I feel like we finally get to control the narrative. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I feel like it's, it's a, a it's there's a positive and negative aspects to yeah, social course. media of uh, in in general. Right. But uh, when it's used for that purpose, I feel like that's that's the most uh, effective purpose for me. Yeah. Like, you know, and the one that holds the most. Uh, I don't even know if you would say. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like that one when it's used like that, I feel like it, it it's a uh, it's more meaningful than yeah. some of the other stuff that happens and what oh, yeah, You I know mean, what I'm saying? You yeah. just have to. You try to look. This is available. This is what's happening. Boom, right. boom. I, yeah. I feel like that's yes, yes, yeah. by all means. Uh, and you can reach all these people out here, man. So it's, yeah. it's very effective in, in in that regard. So with that said, what are what are you up to, Nishi? Like, you know, what what is? I, I know you were sharing. You got some cool uh, tours, some recordings. You know, let let our audience know what what's happening in your world, man. Okay. Well, most recently, we just finished a recording with. Um, J.D. Allen and Eric Revis and myself, the trio, um, and we're representing the first wave of an of initiative that we started during the pandemic called We Up Re Up. And that's mm. like a um, performance um, based um, situation that kind of found its way out of a We Insist, which is more of like an activist oh, situation okay. where we were. Um, which is another a group that was uh, started by us, you know, in China, you know, the initiatives are basically what we, we were talking about before in terms of, you know, being able to own your, cultivate your own narrative and, you know, self-determination in, right. in, in, the, in, the, in the business, uh, uh, basically. Um, and also a, a, uni, a unity as well, a, a okay. union. There's been a lot of contributors, you know, folks who contributed nice. material and, uh, and we'll be, you know, coming together to produce some concerts and, you know, also do some um, teaching and so forth, and mm -hmm. also offer the one, you know, so in in the community and the in the communities that uh, don't generally have access mm -hmm. to what we do, you know, like our music has kind of like got this esoteric quality about yeah. it now that um, it kind of and, and it has removed it from from the community of, mm -hmm. of a, especially of a certain economic. Right. status you know and then also like if you talk about the south that's a perfect example like we're exactly. not in the south near I, i've known, i've done one tour of the south exactly. in my in my career and that was like wow. in the 90s with jackie mcclain in the late wow. 90s with jackie mcclain so i mean we need to cultivate a situation where we have an interchange with the brothers and sisters that are down right. there coming up here we're going down there right we, we can open this up but we haven't done that nearly enough so in that in that um in that group, that's one of the that's one of the um, one of the initiatives okay. is to is to is to start opening up those 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 uh, those trade routes again. Wow. You know, Chitlin Circuit was was an incredible it was an incredible uh, institute. Is that was yes. an institution and whatnot? You know what I mean? Yes. When a, a kid Jordan who lives in New Orleans used to play with my father with um, Percy Mayfield and whatnot down there 
and they used to tour in the 50s and whatnot, and that tour would be, they'd be in Florida, they'd yeah. be in Mississippi, they'd be in Alabama. I've never done a gig in Alabama. <laughs> I did you know what one, I think, yeah. That's what, you know, and you're and you from, so I mean, you know, John yeah. Vetch from down there in Florida yeah. and whatnot. There's, I mean, there's a rich history everywhere. Wow. We need to start, we need to start um, connecting with each other. Mm-hmm. Here, so that, that's that's one of the efforts of that thing. But anyway, that that that's a, a recording that will be coming out Good. Um, in the near future. We're going to be doing some work um, with with that as well. Um, another recording that will be coming out in a few, maybe next year, is a, a quartet recording with Mark Turner and Oof. Steve Nelson and Rashawn Carter, and that's wow. through Giant Step Arts. Nice. Um, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, um, Jimmy, that Jimmy yeah, that's, that's Jimmy Cass. Yeah. That's Jimmy yeah. Cass. That's Jimmy Cass. That's Jimmy Cass. Yeah, Cass. yeah. Um, we um, we um, I I helped uh, curate uh, a series this this past year and the one before in Central Park, um, that was dedicated to the uh, and not dedicated. It was done on the site of um, Seneca Village, which was a black settlement here yeah. in New York City. Here in New York City, yeah. Yeah, and so that was done. Um, uh, also taking into account the uh, the uh, legacy of John Lewis, so it's called "Walk with the Wind," um, and we did that in Central Park. Um, that just finished in the uh, like in July or June. Or whatever. I think so. That was that series of concerts that I was, mm-hmm. I was seeing. So that was you that yeah. curated that. We it was it was a, it was like we okay. contributed. It, it was Jimmy and Jimmy asked me to come along and, and help and help uh, suggest okay. some folks and what. So it was like a co curator type situation. Wow. Um, wow. You know, a lot of there's always a Tar Baby is is a group that we have with Oren Evans and Eric Reeves. Me and Reeves yeah. are, are tight. We've done a lot of we've done a lot of stuff recently. Yeah. Um, we'll be releasing some stuff soon. Okay. We have some stuff out with. They'll be coming out with Oliver Lake, and then we're gonna go wow. into the studio next week and, and do some do some other some other things. So we, you know, there's there's a lot of things on the horizon, and what I'm we're we're gonna, we're gonna eradicate this uh this uh this feeling of um uh, what would you call it um in, invisible the invisible feeling. <laughs> wow, I'm totally still on that. I like that caused mm-hmm. by as my as caused by instead of my friend saying the pandemic, she says caused by the panorama. So. <laughs> she's like we got to get over you know we got to get past it so you know exactly. no 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 it's, it's uh no nah, nah, there's a lot of a lot of exciting yeah. things i mean this is um this was a good a good i mean the, the time period it was it was difficult in a lot of regards but in terms yeah. of being able to kind of exhale a little bit and kind of like from like the traveling and the rigors of the road you know it was it was good in that regard because even though as much as you need that enough to yeah. kind of fuel you in a certain way, it was also kind of good to kind of get like a get like like a real exhale and kind of get an opportunity yeah. to kind of just chill for for a minute. Even though it was it didn't feel like it, but I feel right. like you know you got a chance to just be like, oh, okay. I, sometimes you know you get on the road so much, but you get it's it's hard to generate your own thoughts. Really, yeah, you know, what I'm like yeah. in, in, a, in an organic way, not like when you fall, you're like, I got a deadline, I got to do something, right, I'm gonna do it. Right. But we're kind of like, you know, you, you have some time to kind of when you're not doing that to how to kind of just let those, let those thoughts and feelings kind of wash over you in, in a more natural uh, way. So and, it, 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 it gave that opportunity. Well, and I agree too. You know, Nasheed, I, I felt like one, I I got a chance to do stuff that I never, that I said I was gonna do, and and when I look back at it. I've been saying that for like over 10 years, you know, there were things that I was going to learn and things to contribute to. But even more than that, I feel like we got back to our why, you know, like, why are we doing this? And even just hearing you talk about this concert series that you did, you know, honoring John Lewis and Seneca Village and the Black Settlement and all that. I feel like it made us get back to like, what is the cause behind why we play? Because I think for all of us, especially guys like you, you know, who you've made a living for many years, you could just get into, okay, this year I'm doing this many trips to Europe, you know, next year I'm doing this, you know, I'm taking this many tours to to Japan. And, uh, and now when we go back to Europe or Japan or wherever, I think we're going to have a much more deeper connection to why we're there and a, and even a gratitude, you know, cause I, you know, I, you know, I would see cats on the road and, you know, cats, you know, we get a little grouchy, you know, Uh, (laughs) you know what I mean? Man, man, I gotta do another, I gotta do this and, you know, complaining about bread and, 
you know, uh, or, or uh, for those watching, bread is money, a.k.a. money, <laughs> you know. And now we're all like, yo, man, you going to Europe, man? You don't even ask about how much it's paying. Cash is just, just happy that you traveled again, you know. Right. That, that's going to be short-lived. Though. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be short-lived. We can't get for all the promoters out there watching us. That, that's that, true, that, right? That's what I'm saying. The, 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 the statue of like limitations on that is just about over. Actually, <laughs> like, say, you know, say, bro, I, I know it was was, was the pandemic, exactly. but bro. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We, we still, we, my, my my bills are still the same. My bills yeah, right, haven't right. changed. Right. There was no adjustment on my bills. Exactly. Whatnot, you know what I'm so exactly. we need to keep that keep that in we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love that the sheet. You're like, hey, uh, let's just still let's let's, let's, let's be let's be cognizant. But um no nah, no nah, man. Uh yeah. one other thing I wanted to mention sure. was another uh, group uh, because I I was like thinking, oh yeah, Blood Brothers, a group that uh, Abraham Burton, myself, oh, okay. Marvin Sewell, and uh Lucas Curtis. Yeah, are, are, we're gonna be so I got nice. I got a few things, few things in the in the right. in the in the works of one that was some, was some good folks was great some good man folks. well nasheed i want to just thank you man for taking the time i i know you're a very uh intentional person so the fact that you took the time to be part of this man it's, uh, it's been a huge education for me so thank you brother no no thank you for, thank you for asking me lucy and continue doing what you're doing brother i i, I support it thank you you know and, and giving a voice to the drummers and one that that's very positive and one I've, I've enjoyed uh checking out some of the clips of the i, I look forward to um listening to the whole conversations of the other brothers and sisters that you had you. that you've had so far on the uh, on the on, is this a podcast what is it a channel well, it's, it's, it's a live it's a youtube uh live series so uh they okay. immedi- it immediately goes right up on youtube so any oh, beautiful interview yeah like back to you know i think our first was lewis nash and we've had a lot of great cats uh since the hurl and riley you know so we've i think we've done about eight or nine episodes now so Beautiful, beautiful, man. Well, the next time I, I, I run across you, hopefully we, we get a chance to break some bread and Let's chill for it. a minute, man. I'd love to do that. Let's do it, man. Thank you so much, Nasheed. I appreciate you. Um, Pleasure the, was all mine. Thank you, brother. For those that are still staying on, um, I want to let you know, you know, what we just experienced obviously was incredible. We're going to leave you all with a little bit of a recording from Nasheed's uh, album uh, called Equality. Uh, it's from 2009. It was recorded uh uh with logan richardson jason moran some great musicians so we're going to leave you with a track called tough love uh thank you all next week we are going to be speaking to uh man i i can't say enough about this woman um producer educator uh advocate uh terry lynn carrington and i look forward to taking notes while I'm talking with her because she is such a wealth of information and she has been around for many, many years. And so I'm excited about that. So anyway, thank you all so much. Again, I'm Ulysses Owens Jr. with From the Drummer's Perspective. And uh, thanks for tuning in. And I'll see you next week at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Open Studio Jazz.